this is our audience tonight. They don't know we're watching them, but there are surprises for Ron McFarlane, whose personal heroism has never been forgotten. Dean Lomax, who's involved in a right carry-on over a bottle of lager. And Stan Sala, who's about to meet the family he thinks is locked behind the Iron Curtain. For these people and more, it's surprise, surprise! Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Scylla Black. And I got a lovely surprise yesterday. I got a Valentine's card. Ooh. <laughs> yes, I did. It had a big art on the front. And inside it said, to the one I love, from me to you, guess who? And I said to Bobby, you sent this, didn't you? <laughs> Do you know what he said? Because he's so romantic. He said, well, if I didn't, I'm going to batter your nose down to a blackhead. <laughs> oh, he's got a wonderful way with words. Anyway, let's get on with our first surprise, and it's for you, Ron McFarlane. Where are you, Ron? Surprise, surprise! <laughs> <laughs> yes, come and join us, Ron. <laughs> Have a seat down there. Well, Ron, is this a surprise? A Come miss. closer, sit close to oh, your John. silly ear. <laughs> now, I know all about you, Ron. And I know one thing about you, that you spent some time during the war in a, in, in a prison camp in Germany, is that right? True. Yes, and actually a real-life incident happened in that camp that was later put on a very famous film called Albert R.N., is that right? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Can you remember what that incident was? Yes, Albert R.N. Uh, we had to tunnel out of our... It actually came out of our hut uh, through a... We had a stove in the hut which we moved over to make... dig down. And uh, I suppose the incident that happened was when the, the tunnel caved in. That's right. I'm actually shown on the... On the at least not me, but it shows the actual caving in at the beginning of the film, I think. And you were the actual person. Yes. I remember that scene ever so well. Mm. when the, the German stamped his foot like that and the, tu the tunnel caved in. Yeah. Yes, that must have been oh, a terrifying moment. <laughs> Tell us, how, how come you, were you captured in the first place? Uh, well, we were off Malta. Yeah. On the last uh, convoy that went in to, that was opposed by the enemy. And there was only three weeks' supply of petrol left for the spits on the island. We were very severely rationed in food. And uh, we had to try and get some of these people prevent the enemy sinking them. Yes. They sunk a lot of them, unfortunately, and they also shut us down. Oh, so you're in the waters around Malta there? Yes. And what happened after that? Well, I'll tell you what happened after that. You were rescued by two Italians, weren't you? Correct. And they pulled you out of the water. Right. And uh, later on, you were picked up by a German ship. Uh, uh, no, a German uh, flying plane. A German fly oh, flying boat. Slap on the wrist for me. <laughs> Flying boat. Actually, ladies and gentlemen, what uh, Ron won't like me saying this, but although he was rescued by these two Italians, because of his expert training in survival, you ended up saving those two Italians. Possibly, because they had some rations, uh, which included um, whiskey or a cognac, and it was all gone the first night. Oh, was it? <laughs> Plus the rations that they had, and I had um, the RAF rations, which one of them called sweets. Yes. Which um, fortified cubes, rather like oxo cubes. Yes. And uh, I rationed those out very strictly. Oh, well done. And you, when the Germans picked you up, I mean, you, you tried to pretend that you were one of the Italians, didn't you? Well, I asked to stay in the, in the dinghy so they'd get to Malta. <laughs> <laughs> well, you almost got away. 
away with that. And you would have gone away. You would have passed as one of the Italians. Only one thing. I mean, you couldn't speak a word of Italian, could you? <laughs> well, one of those Italians, indeed, one of those Ital the Italian that pulled you out of the water and saved your life, has never forgotten you. No. And his name is Nicola Patella. Yeah. And he lives in Rimini. That's right. But he's not in Rimini tonight. What? No, he's right here just to say hello to you, Ron. Come in, Nicola Patella. Look at that. After all that time in the war, ladies and gentlemen, his first words were, Hi, Nick. Long time no see. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, uh, Nicola doesn't speak a word of English either, but he has got one or two presents for you, haven't you, Nicola? Por favor. Hello, Ron. Happy to see you for you. Thank oh, you very much indeed. <laughs> I know he said he'd have to get his glasses on. I said, don't bother, it's all in Italian. <laughs> this is a total account of what happened. Oh, yeah. Yes, and this is from his regiment, the 5th Regiment. And it's a present to you, Ron. And there's your name down there. Isn't that super? Fantastic. A little Wonderful. memento of that occasion. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, you're Thank welcome. Thank you, Jack. Isn't that lovely? Fantastic. And I know later on you're going to have a, an awful lot to mime about because they can't speak. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, um, his um, partner, or pilot, I should say, spoke schoolboy French. I spoke schoolboy French, and that's how we conversed. Oh, really? Oh, well, we can all be schoolboys all together. <laughs> it's a lovely <laughs> surprise, isn't it, Ron? Fantastic. <laughs> isn't that nice? See you later. We do have an interpreter, so don't worry about the language barrier. We've got one. And while Ron and Nicola catch up on their past, we'll catch up on our Bob Carrolges, who earlier today went out to spring a surprise on a very uncertain young lady. Well, Joan's car is supposed to be approaching right now, so she's in for a bit of a shock when she sees me storm out of this door. Hopefully they're going to stop right outside the door, but uh, as with anything on surprise, surprise, you're never quite sure. There's a draft coming through this keel. <laughs> oh, so peeping Toms are supposed to look in, not out. <laughs> Here we are. The car, hopefully Joe should be in it. And any second now, when I see her get out. Here we go. Come with me. Excuse me, Joan, are you Joan Bate? Are you Joan Bate? Hello, Joan. Surprise, surprise. How are you? Um, you're... Oh. Daughter... <laughs> you thought you were going in for a nice meal, didn't you? Well, surprise, surprise. Your daughter, Rachel, has written and told us that uh, you've got a thing about boats. Is that right? You've even had your photograph taken by the press sitting in the bath playing with boats. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I heard it's true. And also, your life's ambition, your burning ambition, is to actually launch a, sh a ship. Is that right? Mm, yes. Why is that, Joan? I don't know, it's, it's just, I've, it's something I've always wanted to do. Well, it's an opportunity we couldn't miss. <laughs> Believe it or not, we are going to make your dream come true. Tonight, live on Scylla Surprise Surprise, you're going to do that very thing. Is that all right? I wonder what the posh car was about. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is it, Joe. We better go get ready. Come on. Well, yeah. <laughs> I noticed my socks. Huh? You've let the side down with your socks. <laughs> you look absolutely gorgeous. Well, tonight I'm actually known as Captain Carol G's. Well, it's all right, Bob. Your secret's safe with me. 
<laughs> Tell me, when exactly are you going to launch the ship? Where is she going to launch the ship? Well, uh, it's not very far away from here. It's just down the Tim Thames, not the Thames. Just <laughs> down the Thames. It's by socks tower... onto your feet. <laughs> by Tower Bridge. I can show you, actually, if you uh, watch over there. Can, can you watch... really? Yes, have a little look at this. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. It's not that big one, Joe. Not that big one. Don't be silly. It's that little one there. <laughs> That is the one. You will have the... Oh, and first time on the water today, and you're going to have the honour of naming that ship tonight. Because I'm going to take you over there. Absolutely. Isn't that lovely? Are you looking forward to that, Joe? Yes. Well, you know, you know what you launch a ship with, don't you? Champagne. Well, of course you do. And I've got the very thing. Oh, my goodness. If you're going to have a bottle of champagne, have a big beer. <laughs> don't forget and give it a right yes. good wallop. Yes. The champagne, I mean. <laughs> See you later. Well, we'll be back for the launching ceremony, but right now, it's time to launch our first search line with the one and only Gordon Burns. And, you know, since he complained of, about only having a stool to sit on, we've been building his setup. But this week, has he got a surprise? Over to you, Gordon. Surprise? I'll give you a surprise, Gav. <laughs> Waterloo to Victoria, one importance. <laughs> well, that's what the fair would have been back in 1930 when this magnificent London taxi cab was built. As you can see, it has seen better days. But what do you expect when there are 600,000 miles on the clock? Its longest trip was a little out of the ordinary. According to the logbook, someone called Ludwig Lobel drove it all the way to Australia and back, taking two years in the process. Why? Well, we don't know. Perhaps Mr. Lobel will get in touch and let us know. The route he took from 1951 to 1953 is on the outside of the hood at the back there. The present owner of this antique is Alan Withy, and he wants to restore it to its former glory. But he needs some help because a lot of bits are missing. So if anyone has ever owned an Austin like this one and might have some parts tucked away in their garage, please, please give us a call. Well, Dingle Willington has sent us these photographs. He discovered them hidden away when he was doing repair work on an aircraft hangar at RAF Innsworth in Gloucestershire. Are these two girls sweethearts of airmen, I wonder, who tucked their pictures away for safekeeping and then never came back to retrieve them? Both photos were taken at the Oxford Studios in Swansea. And on the back of the picture on the left is the name Pauline Power and the date September 1937. The other picture has no clue to the identity of the young lady. So, if you recognise either of these pictures, please give us a call. After all, there's nothing more annoying than only knowing part of the story. Well, Frank Stanley is trying to trace four lads, surnamed Powers, Underwood, Fuller and Kirby. Well, those are their real names. But back in 1937, when they all worked at the Glacier Metal Company in Alperton, Middlesex, they were known as Donkey, Smokey, Tortoise and Tubby. Hardly flattering. They spent their week's annual holiday that year living off the land, money and food having run out early on, in a field near Allington Lock, Maidstone. Frank, he's the one in shorts on the right, wonders what you're all doing now. So, donkey, smoky, tortoise and tubby, if you're watching, give us a call on 01 205 5222 now. That's all for the moment, but I'll be back with more on Searchline later. Thanks a lot, God. <laughs> now, last week I phoned a Dean Lomax, and there he is in our audience tonight. Are you all right, my little Chucky Egg? Yes, thanks. So <laughs> yes, he's sitting there with his lovely wife, Kerry, and they've only been married for a couple of weeks. And Kerry wrote and told us that Dean loved those TV lager commercials where they use old film clips, and Dean said he'd love to appear in one. So, as a belated wedding present, we made our own commercial. We even invented our own product. It's called Lagerine. <laughs> it's a kind of alcoholic mouthwash. I mean, you can have a drink and wash your mouth out at the same time. <laughs> so here is Dean's TV debut. And just see how many famous faces you can spot. All right, lads. <laughs> Who's the halitosis, Harry? <laughs> well, someone around here has got a severe problem with their oral hygiene. I can give in. I just don't understand. I do. You do? Of course he does, Mr. Handy. It's you. You've got bad breath. <laughs> right, isn't it? I don't like to get too close, but it seems to me to be an advanced case of pyorrhea. In fact, Mr. Handy, your gums are on borrowed time. If I was in your shoes, I'd be worried. 
If I was in his shoes, I'd run for my life. Why? <laughs> You're a defeatist lot. Surely there's something we can do about it. I'll do anything. <laughs> Later, girls. <laughs> now, Mr. Handy, what you really need is... You said a teeth by the shadow, eh? No, no, no. Nothing so drastic. Just new lager. It's a lager. It's a mouthwash. The ideal party drink and no unpleasantness. So, carry on with lager. <laughs> Dave, you're a star now. You realise you're going to get mobbed tomorrow. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, he will be signing autographs on the way out. <laughs> there he is, our king of commercials, Dean Lomax. <laughs> well, it's time now for some real commercials. But don't go away, because we'll be back in a couple of minutes. So see you then. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, have you all got your copy of the TV Times? Yes! Oh, and so have I. I know someone who has. She's Ailey Bradley, and that's her there. I surprised Ailey in our audience last week. Now, her ambition was to be a model, and we said we'd have her picture on the front cover of a magazine, and that within 48 hours, Ailey would be on every newsstand in the country. Well, with the little help of the TV Times, that's exactly what happened. Now, the first thing we did was fix her up with top photographer Terence Donovan. And this is how the photo session went. down when she asked me to come down on the stage. I still don't know, know what it was for, you know. A new mum I've organised Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Damn it, Right? The shoulders go too many echoes, Kate. <laughs> Good. <laughs> in you go, Kev. Come on. You, go. you don't normally walk like that, do you? <laughs> 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 How often do you have an echoes, Kate? Um, I've had one about once. <laughs> once. <laughs> Where do you live in Eccles? Ellsmere Park. Excellent. Keep that. I'll send you a print of these. Get one through the post. Doesn't she look beautiful? Yes. Well done, Ailey. And Terence Donovan. Also, last week, if you remember, with the help of the Elvis Presley fan club, we sent two handicapped children over to visit Elvis's birthplace in America. Now, they really enjoy themselves and even managed to get on the local six o'clock news, which is more than I did. <laughs> Being able to afford a trip to Graceland is only a dream for many Elvis fans living in England. For John Rowan, however, winning a free trip to the home of Elvis is a dream come true. He's the greatest man who ever lived. John Rowan is a student at an English school for the mentally handicapped. Two weeks ago, he and John Tompkins, also handicapped, had no idea they would visit Graceland today. The announcement was made last Saturday on the English TV show called Surprise, Surprise. The fans hosted walkathons and other fundraisers so that Big John and Little John, as they're now called, could accompany the club on its annual visit to Memphis. It's just that his songs are great and the lights. I like singing along to them. 
Little John told me the Elvis song he sings the most is Are You Lonesome Tonight? Big John's favorite is Jailhouse Rock. Both men say they plan to buy many Elvis records during their trip here. Each says the most moving part of the trip was their visit to the grave of the man they idolize and love. So now we're going from the U.S. to G.B. and it's our very own Gordon Burns. Little blast from the past to start with. Okay, what blast? Have a look. Have a look at the screen. Yes. Now, <laughs> when do you think that was the height of fashion? Oh, <clears throat> two days ago. <laughs> It's got to be the 60s, isn't Back it? Back in the 60s it was, and Vivian Prescott still remembers those days when all the girls had silver black haircuts and wore thick pan stick on their lips. Even the fellas as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I was hardly out in nappies then. Oh. <clears throat> Vivian is looking for her friends uh, from those days who all attended Allerton Grange Comprehensive in Leeds. So if Diana Whitehead, Christine Konicki, Jackie Foster and Penny Frankel are watching, Vivian would love to hear from you. Another lost friendship from the 60s is that of Malcolm Sutherland and Sean McGeer. From 1961 to 1963, Malcolm was a radio operator on a ship called the Barmenda Palm. And every evening he would have a conversation in Morse code with Sean, who was a radio operator on a sister ship for the same company. Strictly speaking illegal, but fun. They never met, and when Malcolm left his job, he didn't have a chance to get Sean's address. So, Sean McGeer, if you're still listening, Anyone who had an <laughs> In other words, call us. And finally, for this week, our quickies. We're looking for Fred Tennant, an ardent Glenn Miller fan who was at RAF Kirkham in 1941, Patricia Lunn, who married Cyril Yates in 1949 in Islington, London, and Margaret Ann Blom, last heard of in Hanforth, Cheshire. Our researchers will be on 01205 5222 until 10 o'clock tonight. But of course, you can always write to us at surprise, surprise, London Weekend Television, London, SE 99, 6, YW. That's all from me for this week, but I'll be back next week. Goodbye. Oh, isn't that nice? Oh. Well, I must tell you, last week, our Bob Cowdries was in Wolverhampton. Gosh, he does get about, doesn't he? Anyway, we had a letter from a Nicola Winsper who told us that her fiancé, Stephen Turley, was crackers about racing bikes. And he rides one to work every day. And Nicola asked us if we could find someone to challenge Stephen to a cycle road race, just like the Tour de France. <laughs> so our Bob put on his bicycle clips with a very strange accent. Regarde. Bonjour, tu le monde. Ici, Bob. <laughs> Il est nine o'clock, a Stephen come debitude, uh, travail dans his office. So, come ici avec moi, uh, let's give Stephen un grand surprise, surprise. <laughs> I think <it's> coming. <laughs> Very posh. <laughs> oh, let me see now. It's not just a Stephen, really. Stephen Turley. Stephen, you must be... Where's Stephen? Stephen, how are you? <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. Turn around here. Your fiancé, Nicola Winsper. Oh, dear, mate. Has <laughs> you see? And she's told us what a keen cyclist you are, Stephen. Is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's this thing you're playing with here? That's not a... It's you're not a... designing a new bike, are you? No, I'm just putting something at the moment. Oh, jolly good. Well, <laughs> she's asked us to uh, organise for you a Tour de France. Well, we're going to do one better than that, Stephen. We're going to, we're going to organise, and we have organised, your very own race, a tour to Wolverhampton. <laughs> well, Steve, here we are at Wolverhampton Stadium, and I've got a couple of people here I'd like to say hello to. We've got uh, Phil Liggett, who's the commentator every year on uh, the Tour de France, and Paul Sherwin, who is the current <coughs> British circuit track champion. And he's ridden in seven Tour de France, isn't that right? Ah, oh, it's an amazing amount. Now, uh, they're going to advise you and uh, help you, and Phil, of course, is our adjudicator for today. Any tips for our Steve here? Yeah, I was just wondering if he bought his ski boots today, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and skis are behind there as well. Well, we've got some uh, fellow competitors over there as well. You all right, lads? Oh, I'm going to win this easy peasy. Come on, it's about time we've got, we've got some proper race gear on. <laughs> wonder what this is going to be. Ah, uh, what? <laughs>
Don't forget, our man Stephen Turley is in blue and white on the right. <laughs> Yellow jersey. Voila, le voulu jumper. Look at that. <laughs> Stephen, I love the way you pulled your sweater down as you stood. <laughs> <laughs> and now we've just got time for a quick break before we join our Bob and our outside broadcast cameras on the HMS Belfast. So see you later. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, earlier this week, I went up north to Walney Island near Barrow in Furness to deliver an unusual syllogram to a very unusual lady. She's Peggy Braithwaite, and to surprise her, I pretended to be part of a film crew making an educational film. Me, educational. <laughs> Look at this. Morning, Peggy. Surprise, surprise. My goodness, yes. So, Silla, nice to see you. Were you expecting me this morning? No, was I? I told me you wanted to do a day in the life of a lighthouse keeper. But we are. We are. I wanted to meet the only lighthouse keeper in the, com in the country, the only female. Hell's like. bells and Ken didn't even tell me when he came in. Well, you're Ken, your husband. He's the culprit. He's the one that wrote and tell me all about you, Peggy. He said that you're the only female lighthouse keeper in the country and you've been looking after this I lighthouse. don't know whether I'll murder him or starve him. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm coming here today because everybody thinks you're wonderful, oh. especially your Ken. And Isn't come she a flatterer? <laughs> <laughs> I've come to deliver you a special syllogram. Have you? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to see the light first. Will you show me the light? Yep. If you can walk across this slippy icy yard. Well, I'll try. You lead the way, Peggy, and I'll follow. Okay. Which way do I go, sweetheart? This way. <laughs>
clapping all Peggy and Ken her husband there in the audience. How are you, Peggy and Ken? All right? Fine. Fine. Thank Isn't you. Isn't that lovely? Incidentally, I must tell you, everybody, Peggy was awarded the British Empire Medal for her services. So congratulations, Peggy. Thanks for writing in. Who's looking after the lighthouse tonight? <laughs> anyway, now it's time to splice the main brace as we go over to join our Bob on the HMS Belfast. Are you there, Bob? Well, here we are, Joan. We're not actually walking the gangplank. We're just uh, coming <laughs> aboard. And Joan, they only do this for very important people. Cadets. Lovely. Those pipes. Well done, yeah. cadets. You did that wonderfully. Of course, we're on the uh, quarter deck of the HMS Belfast, which was launched, Joan, in 1938 by the then Prime Minister's wife, Mrs. Neville Chamberlain. We've got to walk over here to uh, get to the. To turn on this way, George, to get to the ship that you're going to launch very shortly. But uh, we thought it was terribly wrong to allow you to do this on your own, and so we've uh, decided to bring a few of your family along to uh, assist you with the project. Oh! <laughs> I think you know these people. Oh! And here they are. Isn't that a nice surprise? Oh! I ran home tonight. I wonder where they are. <laughs> <laughs> I ran home tonight. There's nobody in. Oh, I'm not surprised. They're all here. And uh, we continue now over and down the steps to uh, see your yacht. They're going to follow on behind us. And uh, it's not as big as this one, unfortunately, as we said earlier, but uh, it's still very nice. I think you'll agree. And there it is, Joan. Isn't it a lovely little vessel? Oh, it's beautiful. Brand new. Oh, look. What have you seen, Joan? <laughs> Your, your name on the oh. on the yacht, have you? Well, that's that's quite an honour, isn't it? The official name of this boat, which you're going to uh, name very shortly. I'm wondering if uh, if Scylla's actually ever done anything like this herself. Scylla, have you ever launched a ship yourself or done anything like it? No, but my face has. <laughs> <laughs> I've launched a thousand ships. No, I haven't done anything like that, actually, Bob. I'd really like to. I wonder how Joan is feeling. Actually, I've got a little bit of advice for you, Joan. You know when you throw the bottle, girl? Yeah. Remember to let go of it. I will, I will. <laughs> All right. Actually, how long have you had this burning ambition to launch a ship, Joan? For as long as I can remember, Scylla. Um, it goes back many, many years when I've seen ships launched and I go goose pimply and uh, I've always longed to do it, uh, yeah. but never, ever thought I would. And gosh, to have this, have Joan Bates sailing on the... Oh, it's... The Thames, Joan. The yes. Thames. <laughs> it's, it's marvellous. I can't I can believe see your it. goose pimples from here, Joan. Yes. I can. And isn't it lovely having your, all your family yes. present yes. there to witness this momentous occasion? Well, wish you, we wish you all a lot of luck here. A lot, a lot, a lot of luck, luck Joan. <laughs> <laughs> and in your own time, you can christen that ship. Thank you very much. All right, Thank Joan. you for the opportunity. It's marvellous. Are you ready? Yes, well, we I'm have ready. to we have to clamber aboard now, which you <laughs> just don't worry about the bottle, Joan. We've got to let me go first, and then uh, we we actually took the bottle ahead of you, unbeknownst to you. If you'd like to I step see. on here, yes. now turn around this way, if you would, Joan. Yes. I've got a card in my pocket, which uh, will tell you what all good people say, all the famous people say when they name ships. You'd like to take that in one hand, and in the other hand is the pair of scissors for actually cutting the ribbon. You might notice the bottle oh, set yes. at the end of the pointed bit I there. <laughs> I'm not sure what it's called, and I'm a captain. Right, off you go, Joan, ready, in your own time. Here we are, ready. the official launch. Right. I get my scissors poised. I name this yacht Joan Bait. May God bless her and all who sail in her. <laughs> I wish I could say cheers, but she threw the bottle over the side. What a waste of a good bottle of champagne. But didn't she look lovely, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. Yes. Very royal. I'm going to make a phone call now. And, oh, look. Ah. It's a heart. It's a valentine phone. <laughs> ah. Throb, throb. Oh, be still my beating heart. You see, I'm about to phone a certain Michael Parker. And his wife, Marilyn, tells us that Michael used to go to a ballet school years ago, but gave it up long before they were married. She says she's never seen him 
in a pair of tights. <laughs> Which is just as well, because she might never have married him. <laughs> anyway, I'm about to invite him on the show next week to give us a quick version of, of a party de. Is that what you say? A party de or a rentre shot? Anyway, let's see how many digits this phone has got. By the way, Michael Parker is, is from Aspatria, and that's in Cumbria, with a lot, a lot of digits. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Everybody keeps saying I say a lot, a lot, but I don't think I do. <laughs> so this week I've put in a lot for good measure. <laughs> a lot. I noticed I said a lot there. Oh, oh uh, hang on. <laughs> Aspatria in Cumbria. Here you go. Michael Parker, previous ballet dancer. His wife wants to see him in a pair of ballet tights. <laughs> Sounds a bit kinky to me. <laughs> it's connected. Hello. Oh, hello. Is that Marilyn? No, this is Julie. <laughs> Who's Marilyn? Who's Julie? Well, um... Marilyn's here. This is, it's Julie. I'm Marilyn's friend. Oh, are you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, this is Sillaria from Surprise, Surprise. Oh. <laughs> you are Marilyn? Well, not particularly, actually. I wanted to speak to Michael. Oh, just a moment. I'll get him for you. All right. Don't tell him who it is. No. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> she won't tell him, will she? No. Hello, Michael Parker speaking. Hello, Michael. You haven't fainted or anything, Michael, have you? Hello? <laughs> Hello, Michael. That sounds like Scylla Black. It is, and she's speaking with her voice. It sounded like. Now, who set me up, I would like to know. Well, I'll come to that later. I mean, uh, you do believe it's me, don't you, Michael? I do, honestly, yes. Oh. Um... I have watched your program and I do know your voice and I Shall feel as though I've been set up. <laughs> well, you have been set up, but I won't tell you by just for the minute because a little birdie told me that before you got married you were a ballet dancer, is that right? That is true. And how long were you doing, you know, the party dirs and everything? We started off at the age of eight and um, went to boarding school which is also oh, ballet that's where it all starts. Well. <laughs> uh, right through to 16. Right through to your 16. And you gave it up when you, ma you met your wife, Marilyn? Um, a little later on I met Marilyn, but I had actually uh, finished with the profession a little before that. Oh, I see. Because, you know, that little birdie would tell me about your ballet dancing days was your wife, Marilyn. I guessed it, yes. <laughs> well, you never guess what she's asked for. Not for me to appear on your show, dancing. Not only that, but in a pair of ballet tights. <laughs> that will put the whole of your program in jeopardy. <laughs> no, no. The, I don't think the public, the British public, could stand that. Honestly, I don't. What do you mean, Michael? Aren't the British public ready for your legs? Not a pretty sight. <laughs> If the people were, well, if the public were intoxicated, I think they could stand there. <laughs> well, they already are. They're all out of their heads in the audience here tonight. Cause, you know, you're actually, this is actually on the television now. You know that, don't you? Is it? laughing <laughs> in the background, but is that canned laughter or is it for real? <laughs> well, all the audience are canned, as we said before. <laughs> I can assure you they're very real and they're sitting out there and we all want to see you in your ballet tights, don't we, audience? Yes! See? As well as your Marilyn. I you don't know if she'll survive till next week. <laughs> well, if, you... if you could see her expression at this moment in time, yes, I, you know, I should have realised that something... <laughs> I should have realised it. Friendly, Michael. Do you want the intimate details? Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. Is this how the tights came about? <laughs> yes, yes. How she 
been friendly. She's been doing a little nice thing. Giving you breakfast in bed and things like that. Oh, no. No. Not that friendly. Uh, not that friendly. <laughs> What's she been doing? Well, she's been speaking to me for what? <laughs> It's been a joy talk talking to you on the phone. I mean, and if I could afford it, I, I would talk to you for another half an hour. But we're, unfortunately, we're running out of money and time. I'll see you next week. Thank you very much indeed for phoning, sir. It's my pleasure. And bring Marilyn with you if she's still talking to you. If she's still alive. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Michael. God bless you. Good night. Ta bye bye, love. Ta bye bye. <laughs> Certainly something to look forward to. Michael in his tights. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who might be wondering what happened to our Tarzan woman, Wendy from Cambridge, well, her back's bad again. But it's getting better. Oh, yes. The saga <laughs> continues. Now then, we've had lots of surprises on this show. And somewhere in our audience is a man who's already had a surprise. Yes, it's you, Stan Sharla. Where are you, Stan? Yes, Dan, would you like to come and join us, please? Bring your wife, Mary, and your two daughters, Joy and Sylvia. Thank you very much. And you two. Would you like to sit down next to me, Stan? And is this Mary? Yeah. Hi, Mary. Would you like to sit down next to Stan? And the girls. Which one's Joy? Which I Joy. And Sylvia. Well, Stan, this is a surprise because yeah. you, you are here because of a result of um, a competition in the national newspaper. Yeah. You won tickets. I never knew that. <laughs> you never knew that? Your wife you wrote in for the tickets, didn't she? No. Oh, you wrote in. It was our joy. Yeah. <laughs> yes, well, that was all a rouge, you see, because uh, there was no competition. And no. she made up that story about the national newspaper. Because your joy wrote and told me all about you. Did she? She did indeed. <laughs> You're from Poland, aren't yeah. you, Stan? Yeah. Yes. And during the war, when Poland was occupied, yeah. uh, you were sent to a labor camp, weren't you? That's right. Yes. But you eventually escaped from there, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. And I was take prisoners after. Because I went home married, like, you know? Yes. And then yeah, you, uh, you eventually escaped and came to England. That's right. And you joined the Polish army yeah, here. Yeah, in Scotland. In Scotland? Polish, yeah. I recognise the accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, after you finished the army, you decided to settle in England, didn't that's you? That's right, yeah. And that's when you met Mary. Yeah. And had your two lovely daughters here. Yeah. But, uh, well, you lost your mum and dad a long time ago. Oh, yes, yes. And the only family you've got left in Poland, really, is sister. your sister, yeah. Janina, yeah. and her daughter. Yeah, Yadja. Yeah. Yadja. That's a yeah. lovely name, isn't it? You pronounce it much better than I do. Well, Joy wrote and told us all about this, and she tells us that you often get letters from your auntie, yeah. Janina. Yeah, all the time. All the time. But all these are all in, obviously, in Polish, and you have to translate, don't you, Stan? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, you know, it's been a long time since you saw your sister, isn't it? Oh, yes. And you know how hard it is to get people over from the behind the Iron Curtain yeah. to the West. Well, we persuaded those Polish authorities, just for you, to lift that Iron Curtain just a little bit so you could be reunited with yeah. your sister who you've never, ever seen for over 43 years. No. She's here tonight. Come in, Janina, and adore her. Enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
The more the world is changing, the more it stays the same. Life is full of small surprises, it's a never-ending game. If nothing is impossible, will you believe your eyes? If the unexpected brings a smile, that's a big surprise, surprise. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I do hope you've enjoyed Surprise Surprise for this week. And also, I hope you'll enjoy next week's Surprise Surprise. I hope to see you there. Please come, won't you? Until then, ta now. ta -ra!